The last time I talked to Zach, he quoted his, I think it was Rastafarian friend. Correct. Who, who said that school makes you stupid, uh, the money makes you poor, and the medicine uh, makes you sick. So, so uh, Zach, um, Zach's been, probably I would say Zach is more of an activist than you are, John, but you're both working on different levels maybe of trying to figure things out. So can, can, you, both yeah. per, can you both sort of give a, a short um, view of, let's say, education in the meaning crisis? Um, and, uh, and, and your philosophies on education in general. Okay. Zach, do you want to go first or? Uh, sure. Uh, please. Totally. Um, thank you, John. It's actually great to be here. And Andrew, thank you as well. It's, uh, oh, thank you. It's kind of an honor. And, uh, so I, you know, I think about the meaning crisis in terms of a, of a, of a broader meta crisis that has these four factors. The meaning crisis is one. And it's mm -hmm. perhaps the one that is the most dire and painful in a sense. Um, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. aside, uh, aside from it though, the other three, you also have what I'm calling a uh, capability crisis, right? So this isn't mm -hmm. necessarily about meaning making. It's about people can't do the work that needs to be done. It's too complex or, uh, mm -hmm. because of the meaning crisis, they never gave a shit about it. So they never built the skills or something like that. So the the capabilities crisis. Right, right, right. Yeah. They, they, so they can interact is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah and that's, and that's a big deal. The yeah. capability crisis, because if you can't do the stuff that needs to be done at a, like a logistical level, like maintaining infrastructure and, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, fighting disease, <laughs> you just don't yeah. know how to do it because it's a capability crisis. Uh, and then there's also what I'm calling a sense-making crisis or what Jonathan Rawson called after me, something like an intelligibility crisis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is again, distinct from the meaning crisis, but related and has to do with this sense that <clears throat> outside of the meaning making, there's also just intelligibility. We can't, not, everything's illegible. We can't read it. The hyper objects are kind of like looming over us and there's a sense making crisis so that just like in terms of what's the case objectively with the world mm -hmm. that's up for grabs in a sense to the post-truth uh, mm -hmm. and that cascades into the meaning which, and then it also cascades in capability because if you can't <laughs> think straight about the world you can't operate on it and then the fourth one is what i'm calling the legitimation crisis yeah and which i think is really important the legitimation crisis is mm -hmm. in the aspect of the political it has mm -hmm. to do with basically who gets to wield authority and why. And so, and again, they're all related, but this one's distinct in so far as it makes it so that we can't even decide who should be in charge and how the leadership should function. Uh, and we don't believe in the forms of political justification that have been given essentially. So mm -hmm. things like the breakdown of the belief of democracy in America is an example of a legitimation crisis. And so that term you, comes you said political, but you also, oh, sorry, you broke up. Well, I was saying that that term comes specifically from Habermas, legitimation crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Zach, uh, just a clarification question. So you said it's largely political, but you think that the disenfranchisement is also in cultural institutions as well, like established religions, uh, things like that as Correct. well. Correct. Right? Yeah, precisely. And mm -hmm. it links in with my notion of teacherly authority. Right, right, right. right, right. Very much. Mm -hmm a crisis in the authority structure of the society as a whole. It's the most acute often in politics, but in the university, it's a huge issue. Yeah. Um, yep. 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 Our, our expertise to be respected or not. Um, so, so, so I wanted to ask you one question about that because you mentioned this before and I thought this was, a, well, this is why I sort of pricked up when you said this, not your, the other ideas aren't good, but I read last time you spoke to me about this, I, this made me think quite a bit about it. Um, I was wondering if, um, part of this, so this is an open question. It's, it's, I'm not framing a cryptic position here. <laughs> um, it is um, the idea that it's not only that we're getting disenfranchisement, is um, we don't know how to adjudicate between various institutions when they come into competition with each other. Um, mm -hmm. is, that, is that also part of what you mean by a, a legit, like, so there isn't an yeah. overarching shared normativity that allows us to adjudicate, uh, you know, when, uh, because Habermas seemed to think that, right? Uh, you know, you have these compete, you have these autonomous spheres, and there's nothing that transcends them that decides how right. 
conflicts between them are supposed to be resolved. Is that also part of what you're thinking as well? Yeah, in essence, yeah. <clears throat> That's what Habermas was seeing. It was a, it was a complete fracturing. And yeah, the, the fragmentation. He was writing that, I think it was like 72 legitimation crisis. Yeah. And so it was just when postmodernism was beginning, mm-hmm. which is what, in a sense, this is all about. Mm-hmm. At least it's not all about, but it's a big factor <laughs> with the breakdown in the hierarchical structures and breakdowns mm-hmm. in things like teacherly authority and political authority, normative authority, parental mm-hmm. authority, all kinds of authority and power become questioned. Power itself becomes problematic mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. concept. But power could in any sense have good connotations becomes hard to even think about. Mm-hmm. And so under those conditions, when you have that fourfold meta crisis, meaning crisis is in there, mm-hmm. uh, then you, it's, encapsulated also in this notion of intergenerational transmission being profoundly disrupted. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's why the meta crisis mm-hmm. is an educational crisis at its foundation. All mm-hmm. four of those follow from a certain kind of failure in the dynamics of intergenerational transmission. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. At least that's part of it. And why there's that failure, why the generation gap becomes the way it is. That's an interesting question, but it's hard for me not to see these as at their foundation being part of an educational meta crisis. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's my, that's my and, thing. And, and your view on med- uh, on education, I think is, is larger than just schools, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's very important. Like uh, well, in terms to be of how you talk, in ter- how you talk about med- education. And so maybe we could think about uh, education. How, what, what's, how is education operating today um, in terms of schools and then education outside of schools? like education that's happening, let's say right now in, in our conversation and education that's happening uh, in subcultures and right. everywhere else. So, so, so John, what is, how does, how does that ring that, that fourfold kind of uh, uh, cr- crisis? How does that match with your way of looking at things? Um, well, I've, I've, I, I, I've always said that I didn't think the meaning crisis was exclusive. I yeah. thought the meaning crisis was interacting with uh, Bjorkman's idea of the meta crisis, and so uh, I think Zach and I um, um, uh, uh, are uh, already uh, in, on convergence on that point. As I just mentioned, I think Zach's idea uh, that he's taken over from uh, Habermas, and, and he's he's connecting it, I think, in really important ways of the legitimation crisis. I, yeah, I think that. That makes total sense to me. I haven't said anything about it, uh, just just because <laughs> I haven't had. I, I, it's not an area that I've devoted time and work to. I so uh, my my neglect it indicates nothing of value. Is what I'm saying uh, <laughs> about that. Um, and so that's why it's a pleasure to talk to Zach about it. Yeah. Um, on the sense making and uh, the intelligibility issue, um, that I think. Uh, that might, I'm not sure, so this is maybe an open for discussion, and it might overlap with an aspect, something that I often pair with the meaning crisis, although they're not the same, um, and it would also relate to education. So I often, I also talk about the wisdom famine in our culture, Mm -hmm. Uh, and it seems Mm -hmm. to me when we're talking about sense-making, if we're moving beyond just sort of the accumulation of information that's been sort of institutionally vetted, I think we're talking about, um, you know, the ability to make judgments, the abilities of discernment, uh, the ability to properly self-regulate in the face of information and problems. Um, And I think, therefore, there might be deep connections uh, between wisdom, the wis what I call the wisdom famine, uh, which also has to do with something Zach just mentioned, the loss of intergenerational, because part of what I say is we've we've lost our wisdom traditions, our wisdom institutions. Mm -hmm, mm And the connection to education is there's a way in which I think you could understand wisdom as, you know, the project of educating uh, sense-making to reduce uh, self-deception and manipulation by others. Um, um, and so there might, I, I, I think that Zach and I might be talking about related and similar uh, things there. Mm-hmm. I, I, excuse me to interrupt. I also want to tie into Zach's, uh, notion of education uh, and relate that to religion in a way. And so you mentioned wisdom. Uh, and so, so you, uh, John has a notion of religio, right? Um, w- which is a bit distinct from religion proper. And, uh, and I've heard Zach speak about the importance of, let's say, uh, um, or we've, we've talked Zach a little bit about how 
a kind of there's a, a going to be a kind of religious renaissance going on. So so I, I found that that John speaks about how we're not able to take religion seriously anymore, and and uh, and Zach has been saying that religion is becoming is is coming back kind of in spades, or this is religio or religion or whatever you want to call it seems to be coming back, um, mm-hmm. and that that has to be somehow fused with with education. Does that ring true? Yeah, with I, you guys? I think that's a, I think that's a, a, I think that's a very opportune connection you just made for having us the three together. Three together. I like that framing that you just gave. Um, I I guess what uh, yeah I, I think what, when I'm using the term wisdom, uh, although I, I I mentioned discernment um, and, and you know judgment. Uh, 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 Wisdom also has it within an aspiration and self-transcendence as as integral to the notion. And that that brings with it immediately, I think, together, these two notions of education broadly construed. Plato set up the first school, the first academy, literally, right? And it was for the cultivation of wisdom. And it was, spo- it was a place where you were supposed to be able to uh, receive the affordance and the guidance for the Socratic the project of uh, aspiring to Socratic wisdom. And I think that's all very clear, but that also brings in something that was also to, pointed to by Plato, which is um, that, that self-transcendence makes very little sense if people do not have a reverence for an order that transcends their egocentrism. Um, if they do not have a sense of, uh, where I mean by reverence, a, a sense of, of being connected to something that is in some, it, it, that has a, that is greater than them, um, uh, from which they can view their previous perspectives in a self-corrective, uh, self-transformative manner. So I think if we're talking about wisdom, wisdom, we're talking about not just discernment and judgment, we're talking about aspiration, we're talking about aspirations to self-transcendence, and that links us simultaneously on one hand to education, and on the other hand um, to getting back that sense of connectedness to what we consider uh, sacred, that which puts us into connection with, you know, a, a, a greater reality, the inexhaustible nature of reality, um, and so I do. I think that those things are all, all tightly bound together. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. totally. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And uh, you know, the I mean, there's many many things to say. I mean, the yeah, the first schools were wisdom schools, really. Yes. You know, and uh, it was only much later that we got this thing that we know of as a school. Before that, most of the intergenerational transmission was religious, family-based, et cetera. But the first things that were built, like, in these places between worlds, like outside in the wilderness, between civilizations, like on the road, when there wasn't code and there wasn't norms, you had this mystery school. And, uh yeah, it's interesting. It's a very, very important concept in education. And of course, it's easy to misconstrue it. I've, I've, I really appreciated the way you construed it, but much of the wisdom research I find kind of disappointing, you know? Mm. And, uh, you know, there's, it's interesting too that the, that sense making is tied into the wisdom and that you can almost think about the different, each of the different of those four crises as having some resolution. And certainly in the, in the realm of sense making, it seems to be wisdom. Um, and it may be that wisdom uh, operates on <laughs> all of them <laughs> in a helpful way, uh, yeah. but but, but sense making like in particular, because right yeah, right yeah. now one of the problems is that we're we're facing situations where it's not something that needs to be fixed. In fact, that the sense making leads us to confront something that can't be understood perfectly in an objective way, mm-hmm. and so therefore we have to take the forms of discernment and self-transcendence in decision-making in the realm of objectivity and causality, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, this is Morton's point with how the hyper-object embarrasses the cognitive function. <laughs> and we're, we're left to be in community with one another, mm-hmm. facing problems that are actually intractable from a purely causal. We have to think about choice and the basis of choice and the way choice works. And then you're in the realm of Wisdom. And as I said last time with you, Andrew, yeah, you don't get education without real living religion is what I called it. <laughs> and I actually meant religio, uh, not like Catholicism that's working or Buddhism that's working, but this actual transmission of wisdom 
uh, yeah. between yeah. teacher and student. That's the only way it happens. And right now, that's what holds the education system together, yeah. despite the education system. But I get a sense that <laughs> you that have sense. you have more um, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to think think of the right word that you have more affinity for um, for actual religion than John does, or, or, or something like that, or, or or for the let's say the the mythopoetic aspect of religion, or the the wilder aspects of of uh, of uh, religiosity. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know John well enough to know that, but I it may be. I mean, I I really think that the religions are quite a remarkable cultural resource. And so in that respect, uh, would never take the view that you find among the new atheists and people of that nature who think religion was a huge mistake. I think it was Mm. not a huge mistake. Uh, And I'm not saying John thinks it's a huge mistake. No, no, I don't. No, no. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so, but the question of how you bring it into contemporary contexts is super loaded because it's, yeah. it's very difficult uh, in right. some rooms and in some cities and uh, cultural niches to, to use religion in a constructive way. Uh, in fact, it, it can only be perceived in a, in a usually like a, in a destructive way. And so, so I'm sensitive to those dynamics, but, but I do think that there's, a, there's something that's like, they're archetypally loaded. They're like, <laughs> in terms of their overdetermined, like they're so much saturated with meaning. And so I mm. think they're going to be continue to be useful to humanity for an extremely long time. And we need to come to terms with that. We'll, we'll never forget Jesus. We'll never forget Buddha or Socrates for as long as uh, what we know of as civilization continues in any kind of way. Um, and for as long as we think that we can somehow overcome it entirely uh, and create this conflict between, let's say, science and religion. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be really weird. (laughs) Like, why are we doing that? Like for ratings or something, you know, like it doesn't make actual sense to me Uh that there's a conflict between science and religion. Uh, So, yeah, so I, you know, I'm not suggesting, again, prayer in schools, (laughs) but I am suggesting that part of being educated is grappling with the key symbols and practices of the great traditions uh, with a kind of world spirituality as Gaffney and Milper called it um, Mm. or new perennialism is a way to think about this, which is some of the work I'm doing at the center for integral wisdom. Uh, New perennialism. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Gaffney's term that we've been building uh, out as part of cosmoerotic humanism and the perennialist was an amazing movement. Yeah. And it was like all of a sudden taboo, you know, Ken Wilber was a perennialist and there were many of them, of course, Huxley and um, so, or Bindo, Tilliard, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, But looking for those under the key underlying dimensions, um, and uh, is part of the reconfiguring of education that's necessary. It's one of the key themes in my book. It's like, we need to deal with this. A new form of religion, excuse me, religiosity and spirituality need to characterize the educational institutions of the future. Um, uh, yeah, especially if we want peace <laughs> and meaning and other things. <laughs> So do you agree with that, John? Did I did I misconstrue something that you said? Or, or? Uh, well, let, let me try and say what, what I don't know if you do. I did, Andrew. Um, first of all, I liked what Zach just had to say. Although I want to I want to talk a bit about perennialism in a bit. Um, I want to I want to know what's new. I want to know what's new in neo perennialism um, uh, uh, that differs it from uh, like Huxleyan perennialism, for example. Um, uh, so so we can come back to that. Uh, um, I. I was just I was just at a conference and I was just talking about, um, you, you know, that I was giving an a, a, a argument that you cannot go through self transform, you cannot you you cannot use inferential computational procedures to go through self transcendence. Uh, there's there's some very deep arguments for that, um, uh, and so I think uh, I clearly articulated. This goes towards your mythopoetic point, Andrew that I think two things are really important uh, for aspiration and self-transcendence, uh, um, serious play and, uh, and symbolism, um, uh, where symbolism doesn't mean a culture, uh, a cognitive ornamentation. Uh, symbolism is um, a particular way of relating to the imaginal uh, that allows us to move between 
John with this identity in this frame to that John with a new identity in that frame, uh, which is what ta- which we are, need to be talking about. If John is talking about, he's aspiring to ha- to be and to uh, right and to be in a world because it's always existential that he's not in now. When he talks about things like wisdom, I mean, or rationality, um, I, I'm, I'm aspiring. I'm aspiring to an identity I don't have and a way of seeing and understanding things that I don't have now. I'm aspiring to a more comprehensive frame. And I need something that's Janus faced in that liminal place uh, between so that I can keep, I can, right? It can reach me in this frame, but it can lift me towards the next frame. So I think um, symbolic uh, activity is really important. I think serious play is really important. And my prototypical example of serious play is ritual. Uh, serious play is how we go into and play with that space between identities and worlds uh, so that we can get a taste of what it would be like to what it would be like to be in that world and have that identity without fully committing to it. And I was in my talk in the talk I just gave, I was pointing out about all these emerging forms of serious play and ritual, uh, like uh, Jeep forming in Scandinavia where people are doing live action role playing and what they're doing is they're trying to create a situation uh, where they're, they're not doing Dungeons and Dragons. What they're doing is enacting uh, real life situations and, and, mm. and the dungeon master is actually like a director that will get them to cut scenes and switch roles and give mm. them various props. And the phenomena that they're seeking is the phenomena called bleed. And what they're after in bleed is that the distinction between what they're doing in their pretense of the game and their real life, that boundary bleeds. So they're getting a taste of mm. what th- this could be like in their real life. Well, that, it, to, for me, is deeply, deeply analogous, although it's taking place formally within a secular discourse and people who consider themselves. That is so similar to what people do when they went into church, right? That kind of serious play, that kind of ritual. I mean, you're going in, like, you know, you're, you're playing with identities, you're playing with alternative uh, frameworks other than your, 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 your own, and you're doing this all with inactive symbolism. Think about baptism, for example, within the Christian context. So I so think- all What's that, the difference then? Sorry to interrupt. Like, what, what's, what's the difference here? Between well, I'm, you know, so is, the, I, who was it who said everything is religion in, in a sense? Like, well, well, then, then it's a, I, I don't uh, want to do that because then it becomes okay. a, a useless category, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think everything is. Uh, yeah. um, uh, well, well, the difference is, and this comes up, and uh, I want to address Zach's point. You know, the new atheists assume that most of the people that are the nuns, the N O N E S are basically they've been convinced of the falsity of religion and they're all atheists. But that is overwhelmingly not the case. Only about 10% of those people self-identify mm-hmm. as atheists. Many of them, uh, you know, have, you know, really crazy worldviews and they have, you know, a hodgepodge of spiritual practices. The hunger for self-transcendence, the hunger for serious play, the hunger for ritual, all, right, and the hunger uh, to get outside of the, uh, the prison of the ego, these, these, I'll use Zach's terms, these are perennial, these, these don't go away. Um, mm-hmm. But what's different between the nuns, right, and people who would identify as religious has to do with commitments, uh, uh, right, to mm-hmm. uh, particular institutions and particular sets of propositions. I think, uh, I think we should pay very careful attention to the religions in terms of how they can be valuable sources for ecologies of practice um, uh, that we should pay very careful attention to when we're trying to cultivate ecologies of practices. Um, but for me, those religions are off, have been often bound up with, uh, and, and, you know, and there's a spectrum here from liberal to fundamentalist, so I admit, I'm acknowledging the spectrum right now, but, right, they've been, but let's, but they have often been bound up with adherence to particular sets of doctrines about the metaphysical structure of a worldview. Um, and I find the metaphysical structure of many of these worldviews, uh, well, first of all, I'll speak on behalf of the nuns because I had brought it up. They find that metaphysical structure and the institutions that identify with it, they find it nigh inviable. They, they, it, just, it doesn't catch them. It doesn't resonate with them. Um, 
for it, it feels to me that it's kind of a no man's land. It's like either you make it all up as you go along, or you, or you're trapped in some kind of formal structure. Um, well, well, you can understand why they're traumatized, right? They're they're traumatized by the the fact mm. that. Um, the secular alternatives drench the world in blood, and so they don't want to belong to po- you know big political machines. Um, but they, they, many of them um, uh, have seen the, the various religions tra- traditions fragment a- around them and be admired in controversy and scandal, and also uh, to often uh, many people, myself included, uh, have you know have suffered personal psycho- psychodynamic trauma at the hands of established religions. And so they feel, they, they make a mistake. I think it's a mistake, but I want to explain why I think it's an understandable mistake. They think allegiance to any group or any tradition will automatically make them vulnerable to all of these kinds of terrors once again. What they don't acknowledge enough, and I think what you're putting your finger on, is that that autodidactic fragmented thing is really, really prone to self-deception. Uh, and all kinds of, of, of you know, bullshit, um, which you see if you actually look at sort of the things they espouse and the, and the, and the practices they try to uh, cobble together. Yeah, um, I'm thinking of Zach's term, uh, the teacherly authority, the crisis of teacherly authority as being maybe, um, I, I'm a key right here, like, like we need teachers, uh, right? We need, um, hmm. totally. do you want to comment on that, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with with John. I mean, I think the the issue of what to do with the religions is a big one because they've been massively problematic. They've also drenched the world in blood, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they've and they've traumatized many, many, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. many people. And uh, and so yeah, it's really interesting because I think it's easy to compare like the worst religious discourse to like the best scientific discourse. Oh, in sure. fact, you would need to look at the best religious discourse. Yeah. And we could look at the worst scientific discourse where you're getting a lot of the same bullshit you find in religion, except it's called science. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what's happening right now in the world. That's causing many of the problems that are drenching the world in blood is the religion of scientism, let's call it. Sort of Uh, priests in lab coats or... or well, that's a whole complicated conversation. Yeah. It has to do yeah. with critical theory and political economy and the nature of the military industrial complex and a whole bunch of other things that reified, as Roy Bascar showed, related to positivism, a certain kind of mm-hmm. worldview. Uh, mm-hmm. And so at this point, I feel like, you know, if you're kind of like beating the kind of like this dead horse of these pre modern religions. Like those have been passing away and it's been a death throes, but the largest hegemony on the planet right now in terms of power uh, is the one that's run by science and engineering. Uh, And so that's interesting to me. And then you look how that's become an educational thing that the largest reforms in schools in the United States were on the back of the cold war. Um, and that they were not motivated by religion, they were motivated, or even ideology. They were motivated to get scientists working to beat the Russians. This is right after Sputnik is massive in flux. Uh, so all the STEM education began and continues to to run. Uh, you know whether that's been handed off now to some kind of economic god is interesting. But part of me wants to look again at the things we used to worship before. Uh, and think about how we can get self-transcendence as you're describing, John. Like, how do we actually have the archetypes to step into? And the mystery schools were theaters, right? So to your point about the role-playing and the serious play, the mystery schools were theaters. And so many of the initiation rites that went down were theatric. And the ritual being like the mass being the living symbol and right up to Steiner, who actually resuscitated some of those mm-hmm. theatrics to encode a new kind of initiation ceremony. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing some need to find a way, you know, some need to, to work with these symbols um, and to, to kind of grapple with the resurgence of religion, which could be an invitation to refine it. Uh, uh, so yeah, and, and the difference between the 
theatrics of non-religion and theatrics of religion, let's say, if we want to call it theatric or the, the two kinds of ritual, right, mm. would be something to do with the historicity of the religious, right? That oh. when I chant a Hebrew chant, this has been chanted for thousands of years. Um, when I make up a chant with my friends and we chant and we take it very seriously and we can get into an altered state, that chant has not been chanted for thousands of years by humans. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the uh, transmission that you were speaking about. Um, it's something to do with transmission. It's something to do with, let's call them morphogenetic fields. If I can <laughs> bring Cheryl Drake into the room, which is perhaps controversial, uh, at least to the scientism crowd. Uh, but it has, so it has to do with the ensoulment of humanity as an ontological factor, um, which is to say that even in a Whiteheadian sense, we're moving through a sequence and there are patterns that remain. And so we step into temples in space uh, and temples in time. And so the ritual can create those. Uh, you know, this is one of the notions of the Sabbath, right? That it's not a temple in space. It's a temple in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been made for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's different from creating focal space to do improv theater in as amazing as that is, as important as that is, uh, to do in that space a ritual that's been done for thousands of years um, is different. Uh, and so, so yeah, and can schools plug into that in any way, right? Uh, schools in the United States don't plug into that. We plug into traditions that are a couple hundred years old at best, and we don't even really buy them. <laughs> like the, you know, saluting the flag and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so the question of how to unite humanity again around things uh, it's an interesting one. <laughs> and uh, right now we're desperate for it. We're super longing for it, like the Super Bowl and other things, these spectacles. Uh, we put and made up holidays, Valentine's Day, other things. We put so much attention into these things because we want something. That's right. That's right. To right. Together that's meaningful. Also the virtual exodus, how much, right. how often people are willing to uh, spend most of their time and invest most of their identity in these virtual worlds. Right. Totally. Just like because they are, they possess the orders of intelligibility that they people many people feel are lacking in the so-called like in, in the I think the properly called uh, real world. Uh, you know, there's there's a narrative uh, in which you play an integral part. There's a nomological order of rules that make everything clear and intelligible and makes problem solving um, understandable. And then there's also a way in which you level up, you transcend. Um, and all this is very well understood and, and you and your actions directly contribute to success on, in those three orders. And I think I, I think the hunger for, for, for this stuff, the spectacle you, you, you mentioned, um, the, the, the uh, what uh, Chris Master Pietro and uh, Philip Mesovic and I call the Ertzats religions like Comic-Con where you get people, I don't believe in religion and they dress up as people and they yeah. spend a whole day. It's archetypal embodiment yeah. and they're getting the archetype like strong. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. The superhero archety archetypal pantheon uh, to yeah. me is fascinating. Yeah. And a weird replacement for religion. Um, and, well, uh, maybe even some slave holder. For what? Oh, sorry, we, we, you, you cut out for a second. I think I spoke yeah. over you. I didn't mean to. No, keep uh, going. Well, I just said like, it is a, 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 so I think that does point, I, I was just strengthening your point about um, there's clearly a hunger um, at work. Um, so I guess there's, uh, there's two, there's one, I guess two questions I want to ask and I want, I want, I, mean, I want to enter into good, uh, good faith dialogue about it. Um, Cause that's something I deeply believe in. Um, so, one of the things, I mean, because so, I followed the debate, the the perennialist uh, constructivist debate, uh, quite quite deeply, um, you know, and it, it's it's even shown up, uh, you know, in cognitive science and the debate between like form and, and cats. Um, I won't burden the viewers with all of that, but the 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 here's what I want to say. I guess I see perennialism as pointing to what's importantly invariant. And I see the constructivists pointing to what is importantly varied. Um, and deep learning uh, it actually cycles between those two. Uh, you, you extract what's invariant, and then you have to know how to vary it so that you get appropriate fitted to, to many different environments. And you need to be able to move uh, very effectively between um, um, you know, compression for what's invariant and 
uh, generation of variation. I mean, that's how evolution, biological evolution, for example, uh, works. And of course, I think ultimately that has to do with things about relevance realization. So and the reason I bring this up is I explore, I've been exploring this idea with Jordan Hall in some of our discussions that maybe could we get past that, that way of thinking, the you know, perennialist versus constructivist, and instead go to a dynamic model where what we're trying to do is not say no. What people should be doing, uh, instead of trying to get a, a, a stable set of doctrines, what we should be doing is, is tr teaching people, again, an ecology of practices that allows them right, to extract what's invariant, but also then run right, to learn how to make, run the variations off of it. So they actually get this, they actually instantiate the adaptivity rather than trying to, see, the, the, my criticism, I like Huxley, by the way, uh, I'm a fan. How can you not, I mean, how can you not like Huxley? <laughs> so gorgeous. Right, uh, and you should, and, and, I, and, I, and what I might say next might be a little bit unfair to Huxley, because you should read The Doors of Perception alongside the perennial philosophy. I did. But if you read just the perennial philosophy, it, it's very, it's, and how could it not be? Again, I don't want to be unfair to him because it's a book, but you can get the impression that it's about trying to find the shared doctrines, the shared propositions. And to my mind, um, this is, this is, this is still a problematic way of thinking that what, like, what we need to be doing is not trying to find the perennial propositions, what we need to do is affording people, like I said, that process of, well, can you, can you look at all these traditions and draw out what's invariant? And then also, can you go back? And in this context, it becomes this way. And this context becomes this way. You see, my model for this is Socrates. What's mm -hmm. impressive about Socrates seems to be like he's, you know, what it looks like it's all he's looking for is definitions. And that's not right. There's a, there's a part of what Socrates is doing is he's trying, to, he's trying to get what's invariant. But you know what's also masterful about Socrates? How he varies that to whomever he's talking to, right? right? Mm -hmm. that, that's what makes him the great teacher, not just the abstraction uh, of what's invariant, but the generative, the creative ability to vary it as needed. And those two are constantly cycling, right? When you're doing engaged in deep learning. Um, so that, that's why I don't... Um, I, don't, I sort of don't identify as a perennialist or a constructivist. I think uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to break out of that uh, at least how I see that often argued about and discussed. And I wondered what this what this might say, how it could enter into dialogue with what you're talking about, Zach, when you're talking about sort of a, a new perennialism. Totally. I mean, I kind of let the cat out of the bag because <laughs> that was that's Gaffney's work. He's been working on this for about a year, and I've been in close conversation with him. Ken Wilber's been in close conversation, and uh, but there's a very real need to to get beyond that false dichotomy um, and to to see that even the staunchest constructivists admit that there is some <laughs> commonalities, <laughs> and even the staunchest people looking at commonalities are the first thing they say is that well, the religions are all different so it's it's actually been a false debate for a long time again one of those things it's like it's, is it for ratings or why are, why are we making this such a big deal why can't we actually agree here uh because there's a tremendous amount uh of uh there's a tremendous amount of important work to do in that domain and so I, i'm loving what you and jordan are saying we share jordan as an interlocutor and yeah there's yeah. a sense in which in a you know in a friendly way and there's a yeah, there's a sense in which what you're getting at also is a developmental issue, that there's a, an ability to work at a level of abstraction and complexity, complexity with domains of practice and mm -hmm. propositions uh, that does allow like the Huxley-like move of pulling out things for one's own, making one's own personal, synthetic, perennial tradition for yourself, basically. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, but that's a, quite a hefty task demand on the individual. And what's interesting about uh, the when you start bridging the constructivist view with the perennialist view, and you start to see what it would look like to have both somehow, <laughs> you end up with that as the educational <clears throat> recommendation. Mm. So outside of what it looks like theoretically, it's like, well, I'm not in theory anymore. I'm actually about 
an ecology of practice I'm trying to create. Yeah. In, right. Informed by the informed by this new neo perennialism. And there's a whole bunch of other things to say about it, which I'll leave for when the book's out, <laughs> basically. Yeah, uh, you know, but one one of them is basically that there's a there's a common sense uh there's a kind of what we call an anthro-ontological givens. And so these are the things that, and Socrates epitomized them, these are the, the kind of natural working of the human that moves into the realms that would create a religion, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is that dynamic of the human being that leads up and through this very complex stack <laughs> to create these things which you're identifying, John, which are like the underlying structural features of religio mm -hmm. or religiosity. Um, mm -hmm. And so being able to distill some of that and saying that the result of that in almost any domain, you start to see things like, for example, like life matters. Like that's an interesting proposition. Life matters is valuable. <laughs> Right, mm. that there is right and wrong, right? These things, these kinds of things. Like, not, not here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Can't say that, <laughs> but that there is right and wrong, right? So, you start to get to these anthroontological givens, and you start to be able to to work with them in different contexts, and it, get, it and you end up getting something that looks like a set of propositions eventually. Um, but also like a, a way to craft ecologies of practice, wow. so that people can have a refined perception and those become things that they could prove basically mm -hmm. instead of things they have to believe. Uh, and so, so yeah, so I think we're working in it from similar angles. Uh, like we're coming in from different sides of the mountain to something right. <laughs> in, in the middle. Uh, and you know, maybe we're taking the faster, longer route, but you're taking like this direct route and the uh, yeah. So, so I think, yeah, we're, we're, talking in similar similar vein here uh that, that feels like a convergence in the sense that you're not talking about uh commandments or or rules of behavior but you're talking about some kind of something more dynamic or something more uh something edu that's educative in, or, or yeah that's well, educative and yeah the, sorry did i cut you off zach i didn't mean to no i please uh, well i was just going to say I, I i yeah i think so and it comes back to this notion of serious play you know, I think of Siegler's work on if you actually watch how children learn um, you see a you see you see this dynamic process uh, let's say they're trying to learn something for solving a set of problems to achieve some goal they'll come up with a strategy for it right but what will they do is they will they will they don't stick with that strategy initially and this is what happens in play they will generate all kinds of variations on the strategy and then they'll put the strategies into competition with each other and then they'll until they get one that sort of wins that out and then they go with that right and and so what i what i'm saying is you see this movement of they'll uh, they here's the situation they abstract some invariant thing they come up with a strategy but then they don't stop there then they do this generative variation right and then they keep cycling and cycling and cycling and cycling uh, and I want, I want, I guess what I'm trying to say, and you see the same thing in, uh, you know, in Hinton's deep, uh, deep learning. Uh, that's how these things work. They, they cycle between compression and particularization. Um, I, I want to put an emphasis on keeping the cycling going rather than trying to stabilize it into a complete set of propositions that have sort of resolved, um, mm. you know, uh, the, the battle uh, between the constructivists and the perennialists. That, that's what I'm trying to advocate. It sounds like you're saying something similar, Zach. Am I? Am I? Am I am yeah, I, I mean, and I think it's that focus on the the ecologies of practice that allow for the self transformation, that allow for the personal synthesis, like that right. you each end up being able to have for yourself a set of propositions. Right. Um, many of which will be in overlapping consensus with the propositions of others. Uh, right. And pedagogically, it's interesting because you do end up needing simple lists of propositions to tell mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when I think of the free play and I think of the way ritual spontaneously emerges, I actually think of P Piaget as the moral judgment of the child where the kids are playing marbles. And so right. this is a completely free, and I was actually talking to Jordan about this, this is yeah. a completely open space. Like literally the kids have, like the teachers are there, but they're not teaching the kids how to play marbles. The kids literally create the game of marbles. Right. And 
it's a very serious game in which there are right and wrong and morally good and bad. And they have, the young kids don't have rules, but the older kids get rules basically, but the rules are flexible. Often they know that they can change them. And at the beginning, when you ask a kid who invented the rule of the marbles, he says, basically God yeah, or yeah. My dad oh, wow. right, or something like that. But by the end, by the adolescents playing marbles, when it's very high stakes, because they're taking the marbles home, they each get marbles to take away. If you win, you get a bunch of marbles. Uh, they know that they created the rules and the play there is both physiological with the marble, but also dialogical, which is to say, how do they, without parental intervention, without the teacher coming in, how do they resolve a conflict? Either is the rule being applied or is the rule a problem? And then how do you know if a rule is a problem? Is it fair? Mm -hmm. And then you go right up and into the Rawlsy and and Kohlbergian developmental sequence. Uh, but yeah, so there's the there's the creation of the free play in these different realms and the free play in the realm of the intersubjective and specifically in the realm of, let's say, the ethical uh, is what's interesting. I think pedagogically it's hard to create those environments because, yeah. uh, and so this gets to your point about it, we can't codify a list of rules that makes those environments disappear, right? We That's need right. to create environments precisely where young people and young adults and adults probably <laughs> find a way to resolve their disputes through dialogue <laughs> uh, and through the creation of norms together, as opposed to the procedural application of a norm to a situation like legal, mm-hmm. for example, or yeah. force. Um, uh, and so, yeah, with the disappearance of the playground and the retreat into the digital, uh, you get yeah. uh, the total intermediation of that and yeah, you know, yeah. resolving a conflict in asynchronous text-based exchange is completely yeah. different <laughs> than doing yeah. so in in re, in the you know the so-called real world. As you're saying, That's we're right. running a uh, we're running a horrible yeah. social experiment, and we don't know what the consequences of that going to be. Right. The, mm-hmm. Exactly, the disappearance of the playground conjoined to the virtual exodus. It, we're running this huge social experiment that's going to have, I think, some pretty nasty consequences or, or that are, are kind of unforeseen by us right now. Um, I, I think you mentioning that, Zach, is I just want to put a pin in that because I think that's something important uh, that needs to be brought more into the public discussion as something that we need uh, to be thinking about more, much more carefully. Mm-hmm. So, Zach, can I ask you another question then? Sure. Uh, uh, because you said something more provocative, and I, I'm going to really, I'm going to really uh, c- commit to trying to stay open and relaxed here. Uh, I mean, I, I, I am a scientist <laughs> by profession, <laughs> um, uh, and I also think by vocation. I love uh, doing science. I don't just do it for for a, a salary. I do it because. Um, uh, I, I, I believe in its capacity to make things better. Um, I'm not, I, I, I think I get what you say about scientism. I'm definitely not a positivist. I do not think uh, that meaning is based on our capacity for verification of our statements. I, I think positivism is a self-defeating uh, epistemological view. So I completely reject that. Um, I think I know what you mean by scientism. I think I've said something similar along those lines. And that I talk, and Chris and I talk about, um, you know, propositional tyranny, that we th- we've tried to reduce all forms of knowing uh, to inferential, computational, propositional knowing, mm-hmm. and the generation of theory and belief, and that has cut us off from uh, procedural knowing, uh, perspectival and participatory, and those uh, which are much more embodied and embedded and inactive kinds of knowing are the main locus of where religio and meaning is made, and so. F- that, that propositional tyranny, uh, which I, I've tried to trace the history out, um, I think is uh, a significant um, cause of at least the meaning crisis part of the fourfold crisis. So I'm deeply critical of that. So I, 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 I guess I, I, uh, I guess I'm also dealing with a bit of, of cognitive, cognitive dissonance right now in myself. I'm trying to uh, my, my, my like I say, my vocational allegiance to science um, and my rejection of propos. I've sort of found a way, I think, of holding those two together consistently. Um, but I want to know what you think about that. And, and then, of course, uh, Andrew, I, 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 I think we should pursue this because I think this is directly relevant to how we see the academy right now. Because I do agree with Zach that we've tried to scientize the academy um, in a way that's um, inappropriate. I was talking about this today that, you know, th- this, this fixation on STEM is removing uh, – 
uh, the training of imagination and serious play and symbolic and the imaginal uh, and uh, in all the process, despite and the, which goes also with the disappearance of the playground. I, I, those are all right. Those go together, uh, which, which were the places where we really cultivated um, perspectival and participatory transformation. Um, so, what do you what do you like? Totally. Sorry, yeah, I mean, I that was just sort of a blob of words, but I'm just trying to sort of lay out. At, no, for me, this isn't obviously what I'm saying. Is this is not just a theoretical issue. This is an existential issue for me, and I have great respect for your thinking. So I, I want to, you know, enter into some dialogue here. Totally, yeah, and I may have said it a little sloppily, but you remember I was saying we sometimes compare the worst of religion to the best of scientific discourse, yeah, yeah, and I was yeah. saying we could compare the best of religious discourse to the worst of scientific discourse, and I call the worst of scientific discourse scientism, right, as if it was a religion capital S. And right, 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 right. Then I said something like military industrial complex and a right, couple other right. things. And right. another way to talk about scientism is something like techno industrial scientific reductionism, which is, is this like the Heideggerian critique? Is because uh, I, I couldn't say, I couldn't say actually, I haven't spent enough time to hide it, maybe, but it's, mm -hmm. it's much more running at it's not an obsession with propositions, that's true. Uh, yeah. It is, in fact, uh, an obsession with application specifically for remuneration and uh, capital gain. So after Bascar wrote his philosophy of science, he then went on to a dialectical period where he cashed in the check that he had <laughs> written to the positivists about the fact that there was something in this that had to do with the nature of how the economic system was run. And, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so basically scientism, the reason scientism holds strong, even though it's actually not great for us, has to do with the messed up incentive systems in the production of scientific knowledge so that in many cases, it's not the unforced force of the better argument. And it's not even the thing that makes the most scientific sense. Uh, and so that is one of the key vectors there. Sure. That's had down, downstream impact on, I think, leading us to these forms of propositional obsession uh, yep. and uh, kind of reductive way of thinking about right. the nature right. of knowledge and wisdom doesn't make sense and there's no interiorities and all of that stuff. Um, but mostly the stuff that worries me has to do with the places where we can't even really do science. I love science. I also consider myself a scientist. <laughs> uh, and I want to save science from scientism. And I want to right. save science specifically from the techno-industrial opportunism and instrumentalization of science, uh, which is different from science. Um, I, I Zach, is that a good place to bring in the iotrogenic plague that you talked about last time yeah i mean that's the most scary place where it happens but um, it happens everywhere I, I don't know what you're referring to with that term can you can you unpack that iatrogenic has to do with injury caused by medical care basically oh i see I and see. so the notion being that if we have a medical system that runs not on not for science right but for profit you're right. right. And you could say, does it run for profit? Well, in America, it does. <laughs> right. And the pharmaceutical industries, which are multinational, which make more capital than almost any other industry, are for profit. Uh, and I'm not reducing everything to the profit motive, but I am talking about an incentive structure yep. that makes it so that advertising revenues, direct to consumer advertising revenues, occupy most of what the pharmaceutical spend its money on, not sure. research. And so the question of also how to bring to uh, the public attention things that are problematic <laughs> with the medical infrastructure from a scientific perspective when they've been so encoded in the social fabric oh. that it becomes hard to even talk about them. But this happens in all fields, right? So there's a, there are scientific discussions to be had about fossil fuels, which can't be had. There are scientific discussions to be had about solar panels <laughs> and the fact that can we create net positive energy production from solar panels or not, that's actually a scientific debate. It's not clear. Yeah, no, Maybe if we put them in space, we could. But right now, <laughs> it costs more energy to make them than they can pull. So that's a scientific debate, for example, that's not being had that needs to be had. Uh, but because of certain motions in the culture and specifically in industry and economic growth and incentives of those nature, uh, you get scientism, which is a set of propositions about what's true. Uh, and a set of propositions about what's true about the objective world or about your own body or about your own mind, that proposition becomes the thing that regulates all of these institutional domains and interactions and ritual spaces. Um, and questioning them is very hard 
<laughs> right? How do you question it? You actually have to become a expert, PhD expert. Uh, and so you're at the whim of the propositions wielded by scientism in the domain of institutional capture. That's like the most negative way to paint scientism. Now, no, no, science no, no, happens that's, in society. That's what I was asking for. That's what I was asking for. Yeah. I think so, you're, yeah, I think that's, you're doing a great job. Um, so I actually know somebody like personally here in Canada who's working very hard to ad address the, the plague you were talking about. We're trying to bring a lot of transparency into, and we're getting like legal success on this, um, into the funding of pharmaceutical research, medical research. Uh, this is a big movement that's gaining steam, uh, largely due to the fact totally. one individual. Um, uh, and because we, Canada has a different culture uh, towards healthcare, it gets more traction here. Mm -hmm. So I, I deeply appreciate what you said now that I understand the plague you're uh, referring to. Um, so I was talking with Johannes about, you know, the Heideggerian idea uh, about science and technology being in this and framing and a, a way in which it, it sort of traps us into, you know, a cultural having mode. Uh, we see, uh, we see the world as Heidegger's idea of, as a standing reserve and it exists only in its service, the service that it can provide to us and that we lack an ability um, uh, to even ask how we might matter to it or how we might be in service to it or that it might, um, how, 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 to what degrees uh, it, it transcends our grasp of it and that we should therefore respect it precisely because of that. This, this is sort of the Heideggerian uh, critique. And it, it meshes back with what we were talking about earlier because I think of Thomas Bjorkman's argument that as we've lost, as we've lost sort of, um, you know, religion and perhaps uh, science, at least in the, uh, uh, in the way maybe you and I and Thomas are all using it, Zach, um, um, we basically, what's the, the market has been left as the default authority. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have anything that represents um, values from the being mode. Um, we don't have anything that does that. We don't have an institution. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just wondering, because, you know, we used to have, we used to have three things that played off against, we had the market and we had the church and we had the king, right? And you could always play them off against each other. And so there was this tremendous capacity for, you know, self-correction and self-constraint um, and not just in, um, in action, but also in theory. And so, what, I, what I'm trying to put my finger on is um, it seems like we've got this homogenization of power down to the market. And then we've got, right, a homo like we're getting into deep modal confusion. The only mode is the market mode following from, which is, you know, the having mm -hmm. mode and modal confusion. And then this lines up with perhaps what I think I hear you saying, where, where science is understood, or I would say misunderstood as the having of propositions. And then all of those things would line up, like they would mutually reinforce each other in a powerful way. Is that does that land with you? Does that does that sound like it's it's connecting with what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, very precisely. Yeah, and Bjorkman's point about the fact that all authority, so the crisis of authority that we were talking right. about, legitimation exactly. crisis. The result of that is that well, it's it's the market now. That's the only thing that can serve. Uh, and so that means that, yes, yeah, science, you can apply the commodity form to science itself, right? yeah. which is you put the scientific finding on the shelf and you actually occlude everything that created the scientific finding, actually yeah. by design, so that it speaks to you as a, as a commodity, almost like second nature, and then you just accept it. Okay. And, right. and so, yeah, it's, uh, and that's, the, again, the worst scientific discourse, right? But there is science going on, or or we'd be dead by now, basically. <laughs> so somewhere there are institutional niches where there's been a preservation of the kinds of interpersonal relationships and personal practices that actually allow for science to exist. And that's yeah. another thing to remember about science is that we're actually talking about scientists. Right? Yeah. We're talking about people and their capacities and their meaning making and yeah. their legitimation and all of that stuff. And where are they? Um, and how did they get trained? And, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because as much as I am trying to, I, I, I am critical of STEM and the overemphasis on STEM, but I'm also like, we really need 
actually better scientists. And yep. so it's not that I want STEM to be dialed back. It's that I want somehow there to be an understanding that you can't actually do STEM if you don't have <laughs> the human figured out. Um, yep. That the scientists won't be able to work if they can't make meaning of their lives. Like this is just what's going to happen. Um, and if that's the case, then we actually have to handle these other dimensions of education in order to prepare scientists to actually be able to value truth, for example, yep. uh, as opposed yeah. to value remuneration, mm -hmm. which is the default value that decides what you should value if you're not given the sense of what is actually valuable. Uh, and so, yeah, the call for the humanistic education is actually to save scientists and to, <laughs> to save scientific civilization. Uh, it's not to pull the funding from science to say, no, actually look at this world we've created with your pure scientists who haven't been trained holistically as let's say Plato or Socrates would have demanded they were, they were trained. Um, and so, yeah, that's an interesting kind of confluences of where the conversations led. And I think it's very important, right? Because who's the wise scientist? Where's the wise? Well, scientist? yeah, I, I, huh. I, yeah, I think we need wise scientists. I, I, I've actually made that argument. I just wondering then if, because we've now circled back again to our educational history, because I, I think part of the problem has been, at least I've made this argument, that for various historical reasons, we, we separated two educational institutions. I think it's fair to call them this, given the, the broad notion of education we're both, we're all, all three of us are using here. Um, you know, when we separated the monastery from the university in the Middle Ages, um, I, I think that has had, that has sort of reverberated and it, it, it it's let, I mean, because then, then the university attaches to the state and then the university then attaches via the deconstruction of the state to the market. And that, that's what I think in a very powerful way, how we've ended up where we are yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, that's incredibly exciting what you just said to me, because <laughs> that's like, that's like the thread through and it has to do with what happened when the enlightenment got going, right? And the 30 years war and the fear of religion right and the needing for yeah to, exactly. add, to, to separate these things and eventually the separation of church and state but yeah you get the powers of truth and beauty and goodness if you if i can say that attached to the state as opposed yeah. to attached to the church so there was a yeah, the uh, university got handed over <laughs> to eventually the state apparatus uh, and then eventually the market uh, yeah. and and so yeah the question of how to pull the academy back into the sacred uh, and make and the, the places that make the person, uh, which are, you know, traditionally the religions, but every, as we've been saying, that needs to be rethought. So now you're imagining academic knowledge production, you know, wedded with the kinds of ecologies of practice that, yeah, yeah. that produce it. And I like that way you just said that. I like that idea about trying to make uh, the creation of, of, of a person within a community of persons the central task. That we're talking about because we're not we're not oriented that way right now i mean we're not oriented yeah. that way we're oriented towards you know um making making consumer producers um right. as effectively as we can but I, I think i just i i what you just said there i think that's a real gem um in, in the dialogue trying to make that you know that 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 awesome and i mean that in the sense of filling us with awe that awesome project that sacred project of making persons within a community of persons right. that the central thing we're trying to um we're we're we're, we're trying to do i i think that, that i think that's a beautiful thing to, to have said thank you Mm. I was yeah. struck by that as well. Mm. Uh, also, Bonita said the same thing when I talked to her. It's just the redefinition of the human being or going back to another vision of the human being, right? As not mm -hmm. being uh, some kind of uh, end product or, or but a, a process. And um, that, that should be the, the main thing, right? Mm. Yeah. The main, main, main oh. point of education. It, it's, it's just, it seems like an almost... Uh, overly obvious thing which every <laughs> missing out completely right right well, and, and the way you articulated and this is all, what you're saying andrew is correct and it's because of what uh what john was saying about heidegger's notion of technology right that we don't we ask what it can do for us basically we don't ask what we do for it and yeah mm -hmm. even in school we're thinking about well i'm going to go get this job so i can get that money and then do that thing right or whatever if you're thinking conventionally or something but you're not thinking about, well, wait a second, if I get that job, how much of my labor 
time will actually contribute to the wages that go to that guy. And if I buy this thing, how much of that goes to, so you're not thinking about how you are actually needed by the system to run. And so if you flip the script and you realize, oh, the school is actually making me so I can be useful to that <laughs> as opposed to a lot, right? So then if you flip it, as we discussed, Andrew, and put the temple of learning at the top of the whole economic stack, hmm. then you end up saying, oh no, what it wants from what it wants from me, what the whole technological civilizational apparatus wants from me is for me to be me, is yeah. for me to develop. <laughs> that seems to be a, a deep complexification of everything because one of the reasons why we're in this state, when I think of my students, is is we're entirely confused about that question, about, about what it means to be to be human. Is that... I don't know if we should ask that question, uh -oh, Andrew. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the question we had before is a, is, is a, a little bit more precise question, uh, which is what does it mean to be a person in a community of persons? Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's what we're, what we're pointing to with the word human. Um, the, the problem I have with the word human is it's nebulous and it shows up in multiple domains. And you can get into all kinds of equivocations. Mm -hmm. But when we're, we're okay. right, uh, whereas uh, I think this notion of uh, person making and and and, and i keep I, I i'm i keep hearing telic in my mind you never have a person without a community of persons around it and that's just a developmental truth right, right. persons right. are not made in an individualistic fashion yeah uh, they're, they're, they're made in a communitarian fashion always um okay. sorry andrew i don't i hope you don't feel i'm being no harsh. no worry no no worries i just I, i'm also maybe a human is something that's we're all human but a person is something that we become well, that's but that's what I want. That's what I want to emphasize. That's what you want to say, right? Yeah. Yeah, I want to emphasize your humanity is something you have. Um, but I want to talk about to go back to what we were talking about. I want to talk about this, you know, that to which you aspire, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Which is the being mode. The so there's an element mode. of transcendence there. Yes. Right? Yes. Exactly. What we're saying. And, okay. And it, therefore, it carries with it. Um, it carries with it. Um, it. It carries with it. The, the 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 deep connections to well as we said the deep connections to education and to a sense of reverence for something that is possesses sacredness for us mm -hmm. <clears throat> totally I actually like the reframing of the question from what is a human to the question of what is a person or what does it mean to be a person in a community of persons and the question what is a human is one that i ask a lot but i'm realize i'm actually asking that question <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that, that the human is perhaps the only thing we know that can become a person. Right. 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 And different from being sentient, different from being intelligent is being a person. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the AI problem. <laughs> it's like well, yeah, yeah. the making of a person and the being of a person is, it's actually interesting because it's part, again, I talk about the best of religious discourse, right? right, right. Very, very interesting stuff about the nature of personhood in the sure. theistic traditions. Like if you look at Corbin's work on the yeah. totally. angelology and the notion yeah. of the imaginal and that it's populated with the persons, um, then you get all of these possible transcendental operators that can lead you through the imaginal, but it's with the concept of person, not human, <laughs> uh, which is, very interesting. So thank well, you for is that. The, is, the, is the human also something to kind of transcend in, in a way? Uh, or am I going too far here? That's the thing. Like, you're, if you're, like if there's like a human nature, you know, like there's this question of limitation, right? But the person is kind of playing an infinite game, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. like, uh, I I got you. And uh, because you're lifted up into this realm of person making, which is something like this communicative realm it's linguistically mediated it's imaginal and uh and so again now we're back to the hebrew tradition but that notion that we've each got a letter in the torah right that sense that the person lifts the human into yes. something deeper than just mm -hmm. material reality uh and uh yeah the the noetic and um the imaginal basically are the qualities of the person you don't find in material or the animal arguably now animals have personality personality is different from personhood yes yeah. gotcha right and uh we sort of misused ended up misusing that term in and uh um 
in psychology um, when we talk about personality theory, uh, because that's fine. We we need to talk about sort of dispositional traits. I get that, but we when when we when we started using the word personality for that, we didn't replace it with personhood as another phenomena that needed to be talked about. Right. Um, and so we got a neglect because of an impoverishment of our conceptual repertoire that I think has been sort of disastrous um, for us. So. Um, this, the, I mean, I, oh, I don't know if you guys know, but I got to talk directly to Tom, Thomas Cheatham about Corban and all the work he's done on it. Um, we're going to talk again uh, about it um, and about Corban. Um, so this, this brings me again to um, something about maybe, I want to move questions, about a reformulation of the notion of person in some way. Uh, I don't think it... Uh, uh, I don't think it's a degradation of the concept. So, so, Zach, you talked about, you know, Corbin's, you know, angelology, and, you know, I talk about the sacred second self. Uh, Stang talks about the divine double, and he talks of, about us not being individuals, but being individuals. Uh, that we're, there, we're, there's all, it's, it's like a Polanyi's idea that attention is always a from to, it's not just a single thing. Um, we're always from to, we're from this self, right? <laughs> to the sacred second self, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, and we, and, and Angus Keller talks about that and about how you have that weird structure and aspiration that I'm the cause of the future self, but it's actually the normative authority over me. Um, and if we're gonna really wrestle with that, um, mm -hmm. we, can we, uh, this is a difficult question, I mean, because we have a long heritage of, the self being just the secular version of the soul, and, I, and again, you, you guys both know I'm deeply respectful to the theistic religion, so I'm not I'm not trying to be insulting here. But there was the idea of something encased, or, or at least it's come to be understood that popular or cultural. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair for me to say that yeah. it's something that's you know encased inside of me in my head, right? And and that's what that's what myself is. And then I understand personhood in a completely interior way. Uh, and, and a completely almost you know, like, you know, brain centric way um, uh, such, you know, well, you could so, like the matrix, you could somehow tr just download me somewhere else. Right. right. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cognitive, the kind of cognitive science I practice sort of c calls all of those assumptions deeply into question and says, no, 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 you are, you, you know, your body isn't clay. Your, your cognition is constituted by you being embodied, you being embedded being like I say enacted and now uh, you know I, I even want to add this extra component that your 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 personhood is constituted aspirationally it's it's right and, and so you're 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 much more uh, you're much more distributed than you are sort of isolated and compressed and locked in sort of a brain centric notion of what a person is did, did that make any sense or was that just a <laughs> Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was beautiful. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. And, uh, yeah, there's a few things the same. And that notion of the divine double is just beautiful. You know, I just love this notion. And there's so many ways to, I think, work with it. You know, one of the ways I think about it sometimes is with regard to like someone like Hillman, who would say oh, there's yeah. actually probably many, right? That you're, you don't want to be monotheistic about your divine. Yep. double mm -hmm. that actually there are probably oh, a set great. of trajectories that you're yeah. on yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. my divine double as a music as a musician like the pan archetype yeah. or whatever yeah. it's yeah. completely different from my divine double as a scholar let's say yeah. metatron or something and so Do you they form up, a community though i mean they're not they're not they a form a community yeah, yeah for yeah. hillman uh -huh. the, so yeah, yeah, for yeah. hillman what's evolving and in a sense what presents as the personality oh that's so cool <laughs> is is a conversation that the yeah. self is actually a core conversation between the many divine doubles that you have. So the self is inherently dialogical. It's inherently dialogical, uh -huh. precisely. And potentially the self is witness to a divine dialogue between the archetypes that are basically living within its oh, container. Oh, 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 that's tasty. So yeah. we can actually instant, this is, goes back to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, right. the analog within the Augustinian framework of the, you know, the, the psyche instantiates some of the, the you know, the form of, of the Trinity. But what you're saying is, right, the dialogic self, you know, has participatory knowing and actually instantiates, right, the features right. of, the, dia yeah. of yeah. the dialogue of the divine. Do, did I of the dialogue of the divine through action, which is not yeah. just your head. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing, totally. but the whole, 
the whole body, the whole body oh. becomes basically oh. like a, it's what I forget. It may have been Corban quoting someone said it was the imaginal ship of death. This is what the yeah, body right, is, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, uh, it's, and so that, that sense that, yeah. The, and so in this, there's a movement tradition, actually the Rasta who told me that quote yeah. practices spatial dynamics. His name is Hunter Torin. He, which spatial dynamics is a movement based practice in the Rudolf Steiner tradition. Essentially, if you've gone to a Waldorf school and done games and your games teacher at a Waldorf school, likely trained in spatial dynamics, right. possibly with Hunter <laughs> and uh, the, the whole movement, the most, one of the most incredible things I ever said was that every gesture begins in the future. Yes. That there's actually, uh -huh. a, there's yeah. in the imagination when you're doing movement practice of any kind, there's actually a, you create an imaginal shell around the body and actually move into the form of the imagination. Yeah. It's very, it's very much like he works with Tai Chi guys a lot. And so, yeah, so there's that notion that, yeah, actually when you're holding the divine double correctly, you're holding the full image of the body. And uh, in a sense, it's the way of thinking about the resurrection of the whole body <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> that you oh. are revivifying the, the actual matter of your body through exercise of imagination. It doesn't mean you're not material. <laughs> it just means that you're in this imaginal ship of death instead of being in some bag of uh, snot and bones right. and skin. Right. Um, as they say, uh, it's also very yeah, so that, that was dope. That was a good, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we got up and into that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it's helpful it, because it's helpful it, for the, about the the Dialogos project that I'm engaging in right now, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to get what's going on in Dialogos and dialectic as, uh, you know, an ecology of practices for trying to afford Dialogos and how it's something much more beyond dialogue as we, where we use that as a synonym now for discourse. Um, and, uh, you know, and so... Uh, this kind of stuff we're talking about here is exactly, you know, and you see aspects of this in the Neoplatonic tradition um, around dialectic. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm sorry. I don't want to waste everybody's time. I'm just explaining why I find it very helpful. You know, and it, and it is, I mean, I found it, I found reading Hillman and then Corban and looking into these ways of thinking about uh, the imaginal realm within basically as extremely therapeutically helpful. Because once you understand the divine double is not one, then you get that there's going to be internal tension between your divine elements, basically that even the best parts of you could be in conflict for time and attention, let's say in your life. And that's going to cause emotional tension. Mm -hmm. And so then you can actually set up internally and sometimes you can put it out in front of you in constellations, which I've seen done uh, where you create, you actually create a dialogue in the constructive imagination between your two divine. Uh, doubles. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting uh, addition to this dialogos idea too, isn't it? That you're not yeah. just dialoguing with another person; you're dialoguing with all your different subpersonalities. And that you know, was always like, there. That was what? always there. That was always there. Yeah, yeah. I, I just yeah, good. Yeah, I'm hearing that for the first it's all, time. It's all through the Republic, right? It, yeah. It's, it's yeah. all through the Republic, um, and 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 Young Young also has it to some degree too. Yeah. Uh, but what I what what came out for that for me was what the, the this, this move uh, of uh, of taking that sense of the sort of the intra-psychic, um, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, dialogue and also putting it out into the aspirational dialogue. And then, so there, there's sort of this dialogue and then there's a dialogue out and then there's a dialogue between all of the angels, right? If you, you don't allow right. that symbol. Mm -hmm. So there's actually sort of three dialogues that need to be brought into consonant together. That's what's sort of lighting up in my mind right now, Andrew. That's what I'm sort of going, aha, about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've never seen all three of those. I've seen a couple of them in isolation, well, but they, they uh, when are... I when I think of the divine double, I think of this one thing. I, that's uh, I, I'm very that what's lighting up in me is 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 uh, it just makes total sense that it's the pagan glory that. of it's the pagan glory of polytheism, basically. Uh -huh, like, right. Well, but it's yeah, also it's, it's, it's also the Lord of Hosts, right? It's also the host, the Elohim, right? The right, host, right? Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> it is the Elohim, you know, and uh, yeah, and that. Yeah, so there's that. There's the refinement of that conversation within, which helps to get the actions basically correct. And anagogy becomes this much more multi-dimensional process. That's what I'm thinking, which is yeah. really, really interesting to me. Yeah. That's very cool. 
I, I've got to go soon, gentlemen, because uh, we we slot at four thirty to six, and uh, we it is almost six o'clock. We have we have. I would very much like to do this again. I found this well, as you just saw with my enthusiasm. I found this extremely <laughs> insightful and helpful to me. I, I hope you guys also found it valuable. But I, I would very much like to do it again. And I want to thank Andrew for putting this together. Oh, I, I feel like I've just wandered into a, a, an amazing place. And, and uh, uh, this is yeah, fantastic for me. I, I'm so uh, grateful to you guys. Um, and, I, and I have the sense that other people would be very interested in this conversation too. So, so I'm, I'm really happy to put this out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, Andrew, if you if you don't mind sharing the files with me, I'd like to put this out on my channel too because I think it follows up. And I, I mean, I I released our first conversation on my channel recently too. So yeah, you know, it's all of a piece, I think, in an important way. And I I, I would also very much like to introduce uh, Zach because uh, I've mentioned him multiple times, but it, this would be a wonderful way mm -hmm. of introducing him to my viewers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing, guys. This is like yeah. <laughs> I had an anticipation of this, almost like it was going to be a music jam. That's what it felt like. I had a nervous <laughs> uh, uh -huh, position. Uh -huh. I feel like this is going to be a jam because it's a triple. It's a triple. It's not a dyad. I think it. Went, I think this went extremely well, Andrew. I think yeah, I, I, it I, feels I'm, like that to me. I'm as very well. pleased. I'm extremely pleased. <laughs> yeah. Me too, guys. If anybody has some closing thoughts they want to state, I, I, I I'm mm -hmm. still here and, to, and willing. You know, happy to listen. Did you have anything else to say, uh, Zach? No, I mean, the moon is gorgeous right now in Vermont. It seems, <laughs> uh -huh, it seems uh -huh. bigger than usual, so. <laughs>